to call us to order? Excuse me? Are you about to call us to order?
Uh, we will, the, the exact subject has yet to be determined. I'm working on that and, and uh, taking suggestions. A few things have been suggested. Uh, no promises on what exactly it will be, but I will let you know. But hopefully uh, you'll come and check it out. Um, it's a great way to grow in your faith, a great way to grow in fellowship, uh, a great way to grow as a human being. So uh, that will be coming up in a couple of weeks. Other announcements of upcoming events uh, we need to, to take note of. Did we mention this afternoon? Pines. Thank you. That is right here, and I skipped right over it. I'm reminded them. My apologies. Uh, yes, uh, Whistling Pines is happening at 3 o'clock. There's going to be a worship service there for the residents. Um, Pat's going to be leading it, and or be playing the piano, I suppose. And anything we need to know about that? Everybody come to can. <laughs> Everybody come to can. What do y'all normally do? Just sort of uh, sing music with them? Or? We sing songs with the residents and someone brings a little short 15, 20 minute message to the residents and who's there. And, and who's bringing your message today? I don't know. I don't know where you take that, but I don't schedule that. Okay. Um, Sarah Doak's not here. She usually knows what's going on about that. But I don't know. I'll get in touch with her after service and just make sure I need to come help for that part of it. I'm sure we'll. Excuse me. All right. Any other announcements? Prayer concerns, updates, joys, uh, concerns, any sort. Yes, Taylor. Uh, my sister had her knee replacement surgery Wednesday of this week. She was doing fine. They released her to a rehab service Saturday morning, but. This morning they took her back to the hospital because her kidneys have stopped working. So I'm really concerned about her and I appreciate your prayers. Yes, ma'am. Any other? <laughs> uh, several of y'all have asked and just to give you an update also. Our Aunt Donna, uh, we visited this probably this last week up in Oklahoma. Uh, will hopefully be going home today. They've been, asked, they've been trying to get her out of the hospital for three or four days. She has now been in the hospital for about three weeks, and um, they have decided to not pursue chemotherapy anymore. It just has too harsh a reaction to her body. Um, her platelet count has been sort of going up and down and up and down, and hopefully uh, it's up and up that she can actually go home. Um, to walk, we're not sure. Just, she was just, she's just ready to be home, and then they'll decide what to do next as a family. Uh, appreciate your continued concerns for her health as well. Yes, ma'am. Remember Jerry in your prayer, please. For anything in particular? I mean, you want to specify? No. Continued prayers for my sister Kay. Kay.
and uh, it turned out to be a much longer and harder day than we expected, and we didn't make it back to a late. But, um, we have that similar boys around. We have another one that we want to speak with, uh, Casey. And we got some other uh, young ladies in the uh, congregation this morning who are about to start college as well. So we'll add all of our college-bound our college bound uh, folks to our prayers this morning. Um, yeah, keep that head straight. <laughs> other concerns, other joys, anything else at all, folks? Tuesday week. I think I was telling somebody next Tuesday, but it's Tuesday week. If others looking for some kind of Well, there's nothing else. Let's uh, let's go into our worship. Um, Sarah uh, could not make it this morning. Oh, sorry. Let's put Sarah on our prayer list as well. She has uh, got a terrible hair cold this morning, could not make it, and so I'm sure that's why all the, the Doak family's not here. But um, she normally does our children's message. I would be happy to take that up, or we can, what, what, what do y'all want to do? I want to ask y'all, what are our children? Mm -hmm. I'll be fine. Mine could always use it. We all could. All right, so I will do the children's message this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to tickle my throat this morning as well. Uh, well, let's just be on the opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
And that those who are not with us this morning, that you reach out across time and, and space and, and simply touch those lives of, of the folks that we carry within our hearts, that we care about, that we love, that we are concerned about. We thank you, Lord, for, for joys that have been shared for our college-bound children, not children, young adults, going to school soon and ask, Lord, that you that you take the anticipation and anxiousness that they may feel and that you turn that into reassurance that they are going somewhere where they can create a better life for themselves through through education. We ask, Lord, that you, you know, help them stay a good course, to not be tempted by the distractions that often come when you go off to college, and to stay on the path that you're setting before them to, to get degrees and, and better jobs in the future. We thank you, Lord, for fathers. And ask especially, Lord, that you bless uh, Melba's father this week with, uh, with a smooth transition to a new home and a new environment. And that you guard her and you watch over her as she travels home tomorrow. We thank you, Lord, for... Excuse me. We thank you, Lord, um, for sisters and for brothers. And especially, Lord, we lift up Peggy's sister this morning and, and ask, Lord, that you will bless her with, with kidneys that will work again, that you bring some sense of healing into her life, that you allow her to return home soon and better health. We lift up Sarah before you, Lord, asking that you give her a swift recovery from her, from her cold that she seems to be suffering from this morning. And Lord, we especially lift up Kay this morning, ask that you will just renew her, her love of life, that you'll help her get over whatever despondency that she may be feeling and to simply know that, that what she's been blessed with in this Lord is, is good and worth living. Lord, for Jerry, whose needs you know better than we know ourselves, we're lifting up before you knowing that, that you can meet those needs. And we just ask, Lord, for your mercy and your grace upon his life. For Ronnie, who's about to have a, a pacemaker replaced, we just ask, Lord, that that goes smoothly and well and, and give him some a good ticking heart. And just, Lord, for all the other concerns that we may have not voiced in words and carrying our thoughts. And we ask, Lord, that you just simply meet those needs. For the joys that you bless us with, we thank you, Lord, for the concerns that we carry with us, Lord. We, we thank you for the love that you've given us to care about those folks and just lift them up to your Praise God, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we've got a shortage of our, our youth this morning. I, I think we've got a few, though. Can we have some folks come up and help with our offering? Anybody? Thanks, Did you come up? Thank you. Lord, as we uh, come together, we just ask that you accept our offerings as a return to the graciousness and the love and the blessings that you give to us. Amen.
Oh, Jesus, I have promised of 396, first and last. says underneath Tenney Chapel. Nobody? Uh, honoring faithful generations, past, present, and future. So what do you think a faithful generation is? Any ideas? Okay. Let's back up a little bit. Draw a company here. <laughs> so, um, if we're going to talk about what faith is, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, so maybe I'll be a little bit clearer. Um, how do we get to heaven? How about that? Ask about being faithful to a friend. How about being faithful to a friend? Yeah, let's take it out of the context necessarily of churchy faith. Just what is faith mean? Being faithful to a friend. Huh? Got to speak up. Loyal. Okay, that's good. Loyal. What does it mean to be loyal? To be trusted. And to be trustworthy. That's a good answer. Okay. So, if we can translate that, which is really no translation at all, it's already there. If we take faithfulness to a friend as being loyal, being trustworthy, being trusted, what can we say, how does that translate to our faith in church? Who would we be faithful to if we were to have faith in this in this setting, in this aspect of our lives, our spiritual lives? God. Okay, God. So we're going to be faithful to God. So what does that mean then? To trust in Him. And what does it mean to trust in somebody? To you? If, if I'm going to trust you, or you're going to trust me, what what has to happen? Don't lie to them. Yeah, that's, that's a good that's a good one there. Yeah, yeah. Um, to maybe be someone that they can depend on, or that you can, or that they can depend on you. Okay. Um, to be honest in your relationship. No one likes a friend who lies to them or you know. Stabs them in the back when they're when 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 they were not with you or something like that. We probably all had a friend. I hope you have it, but maybe you have. Um, 
had a friend that maybe you found that really wasn't uh, very, wouldn't say nice things about you when you're away from things like that. Um, anyway, let's get back on topic. Um, <laughs> let's just let's break it down. Let's keep it simple, uh, or let's keep it just to the to what it is the essentials. Um, a huge part of what faith is is trusting in God, because God has faith in you. Believe it or not, God is trusting in you when you're in a relationship with God to be um, to be who it is that He wants you to be, uh, to be a person of God, to be a Christian. Do you know what a Christian means? Like literally, it actually has a meaning. It's kind of funny. It's actually was intended as an insult 2,000 years ago. It actually means something. Do you may know what a Christian means? Little Christ. Look at those little Christ there, those little Christians. That's what they call the first followers of Christ. And uh, but it's actually something we, we, uh, we <coughs> should carry with honor, that, that label, because we are trying to be like little versions of Christ. Someone who's good and someone who's honest and someone who is... Faithful to God. Uh, See, so anyway, that's a little bit of what faith is. I don't know. So I don't have quite the, the quite the rapport Sarah probably has with y'all. But, um, but anyway, that'll sort of lead to what we're going to talk a little bit back, uh, about in a minute. Um, can we say a prayer? Precious God, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for trusting in us, for believing in us, for loving us enough to have faith in us, to be the people that you called us to be. We ask, Lord, that as we struggle through life and as we go through the, the ups and the downs, the ebbs and the flows, the good days and the bad days, that through it all, we're able to maintain our faith in you, to trust in you, to be with us no matter what, to trust in you, to always love us even when we don't feel lovable, to trust in you to forgive us even when we don't think we're good enough to be forgiven. Lord, may our faith be in you always, for that is what makes us your people. It's your name we pray. Amen. Do you want to hand up the candy? There is a saying, sort of a joke, in seminary, that if you give a theologian the Book of Romans, something big will happen. We're going to be reading this morning from the Book of Romans, first uh, an excerpt from chapter 1, and then a slightly longer section in chapter 3. And I hope that you'll see that indeed this book has been incredibly influential in our understanding of faith, our understanding of theology, our understanding of what it means to be a Christian, to be a little Christ, as I sort of told you. Hear now the word of the Lord as it comes to us this morning from Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and then chapter 3, verses 22 through 31. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. And then if we flip forward to chapter 3, verses 22 through 31. Sorry, I need glasses. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by His grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because of his divine forbearance, righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes a boasting is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No. By the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. For is God the God of Gentile or of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one and he will justify the circumcised on the ground of faith and the uncircumcised through that, some, through that same faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary. 
Will you uphold the law? For the word of God is scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. And on the front doors, as you enter here, you walk under a sign if you go through the front doors. And it says, honoring the faithful generations, past, present, and future. Sort of a charge, isn't it? And a promise to keep faithful, to teach faith. It's a word we use a lot in, in church, right? Something we claim to all have, or be working towards at least, on one of them. Where did you get your faith from? Where did you learn faith? Was it a, a grandmother, a, a, a grandfather, a parent, a friend, a pastor? For me, uh, an extremely influential person in my own formation of faith, my own understanding of faith was Pastor Carl. Pastor Carl was my pastor uh, at Our Savior Lutheran Church when I was uh, young, when I was a boy. He was the one who baptized me. He was the one who taught my confirmation class. He was one that held my hand and prayed with me when my father died. He's a monumental figure in my life because he was and continues to be probably one of the best men I've ever known in my life. Uh, an example of a good Christian and a good pastor, of a good father, of a good husband. A good friend. And one of the things that I gathered from Carl uh, over the years, one of the last times I saw him was actually when I was struggling with my own decision to go into ministry. And he has moved all over the country serving different churches and different forms of ministry. Is that reminder that faith is a journey. It's not a destination. It's like I, I arrived one day and I, I got my golden ticket and that's all there is to it. It's an ongoing journey. And those of us who, who've been around the block a time or two know that faith is not always easy, is it? It's, I sort of think of it like, like a stream. It, it sort of ebbs and flows. And, and there are moments in my life when my faith in God feels kind of like a river, you know, and, and, and it's all like, you know, you're the best, and I know you, and you love me, and I love you, and it's all good. And there are times that I have my doubts. And I question, and it feels more like a little trickling stream because maybe I've had some obstacles or some challenges that I've not quite overcome yet, in my mind at least. Faith is not always easy, but it is a journey. And faith is the first thing that Martin Luther discovered as one of those five tenets we're going through. So. Just to sort of catch all up to speed, we've got some, some new faces in here for me this morning. Uh, we're sort of going through a series uh, that I'm trying to do here called, I'm calling, my Back to School series, right? And we're going to sort of touch back and review what it is that makes us a Christian. And we're going to go back to, to the Reformation, to the, the first Protestant, uh, or who we think of as the first Protestant, Martin Luther. And he was extremely influential in what it is that we hold near and dear as Christians today. So Martin Luther, one of the very first things he discovered, um, or rediscovered, I should say, is faith as being pivotal in who it is or what it means to be a Christian. As a young man, Martin Luther, and we're going back 500 years, as a young man, Martin Luther wasn't very sure of that. He was not positive that God loved him. He believed in God, but he wasn't really sure how much God cared about him. He had his doubts. He had his struggles. He did not think he was good enough because in his time, the, the belief that was being taught by the church, and this was the Roman Catholic Church, a very different church then than it is now, the belief was that you earned your way to heaven. You did good works, works of piety, works of charity, good things for others, good things in, in worship, and it was something that you had to work your way towards. You could even buy some some steps to get to the uh, to get to the, to heaven. But as you know, we're not always perfect, are we? We we have our faults. We we commit our sins. We have those stray thoughts that that we're ashamed of. 
and those deeds that we know are wrong. And so, like anyone, or like many people, though, he was doubtful of where his, his faith in God really was because, not his faith in God, but God's faith in him, because of the way the system was set up. It was um, something he described like this. Give me just a moment. Now, because of low ceiling in here, I can't bring in a full-size ladder, but hopefully this will help illustrate the point. He described the journey to heaven, as he understood it at the time, as being sort of like a ladder. Okay? Like a ladder. And when you do something good, a work of charity, a work of piety, something that is pleasing to God, it's like putting a rung on that ladder, a step on that ladder. So, I've helped feed the hungry. That's a work of charity. Is serving God's kingdom, right? I get a little closer to heaven. I go to Sunday school, or I go to worship, and I praise the Lord. I lift up my voice. I listen to the, to the preacher. I study scripture, whatever. I get a little closer to heaven. But what's the problem with this illustration? I run out of la I run out of steps. Because there are not enough steps on any ladder to get you all the way to heaven, are there? Because we are imperfect. We are faulty. We mess up. We do it all the time. No matter how many good things we do, it doesn't seem like there's ever going to be enough to overcome some of the bad things we do or the sinful things we do. And so for him, that, that mindset, that belief at the time... It made him feel like he wasn't good enough. So much so that he was riding his horse. Three parts, right? He was riding his horse. He was heading home. And a thunderstorm rolled up on him. And there was lightning. And there was thunder. And uh, he was terrified. And his horse was terrified. And his horse threw him off. And ran off. He was afraid that in that moment, he was going to die in that storm. And he prayed to God. But what did he pray for? He prayed, Dear Lord, don't kill me because I'm not ready to meet you yet. And if you will spare my life, I will serve you. And guess what? He lived. Right? And he became an Augustinian monk. He followed through with his word. He became a priest. He became a theologian, someone, a scholar who studied scripture, studied theology, taught it. So he truly dedicated his life to it. But as a scholar, when he began studying the scriptures very closely and, and uh, learning what they said at the deepest levels, what he found was that what he was studying did not jive with what the church was teaching. And especially when he got to the book of Romans, and specifically the passages we just read. Because there's nothing about steps of a ladder in the book of Romans, is there? There's a lot of other stuff. What well, he learned is it's about faith that we are saved. Faith alone. It's not something you earn. It's not something you buy something God offers you and you simply choose to accept it. That's a completely different story uh, than what was being taught by the church. But the church uh, had not translated scriptures into the common tongue. The people in the pews, they just simply had to believe whatever they were taught. Well, Martin Luther couldn't, couldn't live with that. And so he came up with, with a term. Came up with several terms. Last week it was sola scriptura, one scripture. All other teachings are secondary to what this book says. And then he came up with sola fide, faith alone, faith in Jesus Christ, as what it is that brings you into the kingdom, that allows you to be incorporated into that body of Christ we call the church. It was as if he had been struck uh, with a bolt of lightning. His faith alone. 
And for the first time, Luther understood what it meant to be a Christian. And that understanding has informed our understanding of what it means to be a Christian. You see, if you give a theologian the book of Romans, something big is going to happen. And that's a pretty big thing. The dominoes started to fall. It led to the Reformation. Led to the Lutheran Church. And eventually led to us being here in the Methodist Church 500 some odd years later, right? Now let's fast forward just a little bit more. Luther has started the Reformation uh, inadvertently. He didn't really intend to you know, create a revolution. That's just what happened when you go against the teaching of the church at the time. The Reformation begins, and about 200 years later, in 1735, there's another priest. This time it's an Anglican priest. His name is John Wesley. You may have heard of him. He's pretty influential in why we're here today. He was a pivotal figure in the Methodist uh, church. And he also was rather despondent and unsure of God. Not his faith in God. He had no doubts of belief in God, but he did not feel worthy. So much so that he was thinking about putting the ministry all together because he just was not assured of his place in God's life. He was on a boat. He got on a boat to come from England to the American colonies. This is pre-revolution, pre-American revolution. And he's sailing to the colonies to, to preach and, and to meet with some other priests and, and that sort of thing. But he was very despondent. He was very depressed. He was very unsure again of, of where it was that he was um, in his faith life. And lo and behold, a storm comes up, right? Another storm. Different storm, of course, than what hit Luther, but had a similar effect. And it was such a bad storm that the mast on the ship itself broke. And the ship was being tossed around on the sea. And guess what? John Wesley was terrified. He was afraid of dying. Dying unsure of what was going to happen when he died. Unsure of whether he was truly a Christian or not. And he sees off on the other side of the deck a group of people. They were German Christians, Pomeranians. And these people were handling the situation a little bit different. They were standing together. They were praying. They were calm. They were cool. They were collected. They showed no outside signs of fear or panic or terror. They were completely assured that no matter what, at the end of the day, they were going to be with God one way or the other. Do you in this life or the life to come? And he wrote in his journal, he's a, he's a prolific journaler. I wish I had a faith like that. Don't you? Don't you like to have that sort of faith that you can look death square in the eye and say, bring it. Let's do this. Just this week we met with Kim's aunt. She's the one that's facing cancer. She's the one that they are saying, you've got two choices, a miracle or hospice, basically. And of course, she doesn't want to leave her family. She loves them. But at the same time, she told us, oh, I don't want to stay here. And what's to come is so much better. That's faith. John Wesley wanted that sort of faith. And so he sort of followed these Moravians and he studied what they studied. And for the next two or three years, he continued to sort of struggle with his own faith and try to figure it out. And he was invited to a Bible study. Well, y'all better be careful to go to those Bible studies. They'll change your life. <coughs> and he didn't really want to go. You know how it is. Like, I've got things to do. You know. It was on Aldersgate. This was back in England. And he reluctantly goes to this Bible study because he had, I guess, made a commitment to go and didn't want to not show up. And at the Bible study, he writes... He wrote that they, someone, was reading Martin Luther's preface to guess which book of the Bible? Romans. How about that? And he had this moment in which he wrote, he felt his heart strangely warm. He felt his heart strangely warm. Now, 
John Wesley was not known as an especially emo emotional man, so this was a kind of a big moment. And he, he continued to write. I'm going to go quote here as well. I'm just coming to my notes just to make sure I read it right. Uh, yes. 1738 is when this happened. I felt I did trust Christ. Christ alone for salvation. And assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. So even though we may theologically understand, we may get it that, that it's by faith that we're saved and, and that God will forgive us of anything, sometimes that's still hard to wrap your head around, isn't it? And sometimes it's hard to not beat up on yourself and believe that you're not good enough. It's sometimes hard, easy to question, how could God love me? Because I know how I really am inside. I know what I think. I know the things I've done. How can God forgive that? But the truth is, God can forgive because God loves us that much. I myself had that struggle many times in life. But the, the, probably the biggest moment for me is, and it's so weird that we're, I'm preaching about this in a way because it's almost like my life has been in a way a microcosm of this little history lesson I've just given you. And that I was raised in the Lutheran Church and held near and dear that theology and that doctrine in my heart. And grew up from that young boy who was influenced so strongly by Pastor Carl back in the day to someone who was teaching the youth and, and an elder on the church council. And basically when the doors were open, I was there and I probably had my family with me to one who had become very despondent because of some things that happened in the church and was really starting to doubt my worthiness because I had been taught continually by the, the clergy at the time that I was, like the rest of us in the words of Martin Luther, a miserable bag of maggots. Isn't that great? That's what Luther put it. He said we're not worthy, okay, except by the grace of God. But I've been hearing about the unworthy part, but not hearing about the grace part. And it got to the point where we decided to maybe go somewhere else. Try a different church. And Kimberly had been a member or had been involved in the Methodist Church in Sulphur Springs. So we said, well, let's go there. It's a nice, pretty church. We've got some friends there. That'll be a start. And we're going to sort of find the place that our family feels at home. And the pastor there, Gifford Long, I don't know if you've ever met him. Another one of those influential faith persons in my life. Was preaching a sermon that very first Sunday I was there. And he said words I still carry with me and think about quite often. He said, Jesus Christ loves you. Even you. Especially you. That still chokes me out to this day. Because I was really wondering, does God love me? For me to feel the way I did about myself at that time. And as a reminder, that it's not about... <laughs> There's a dog in the church. <laughs> it wasn't about what I had done for God. It was about what God was doing for me. And faith is about what God is doing for you. It's not necessarily something you work your way towards or you earn yourself to do. It's simply a choice you make. Am I going to accept that goodness? Am I going to allow God to love me the way that God truly loves me? Am I going to let that shine into my life? That's what it takes to be a Christian. You young folks, I wasn't trying to play tricks on you anything here, I promise you. I just want to sort of see what you would say because we get so discombobulated sometimes when we're saying these simple questions. What is faith? What is grace? What is forgiveness? And quite simply, the answers are simple. It's simply allowing God to love you and to love God's love. <coughs> Believing in God because God believes in you. God knows that each and one of, every one of you is capable of awesomeness and of goodness if we simply open ourselves up and allow God to live within us. That's what faith is. Trust Him. Good word. Trust Him. Trust Him in God. Now, that does not take being a person that does good works out of the picture. We'll get to that shortly.
shortly, not today, but in, in, in the next week or two. And next week we're going to talk about grace and really what that looks like. But today, I just want to reiterate what it is that faith means in the church. Sometimes the church makes it harder than it needs to be. And I'm talking about this church or that church. I'm not trying to make this again, you know, we got it right, they got it wrong, anything like that. That has nothing to do with it. I'm not about denominations, I promise you. I'm going to talk about what it means to be a Christian. But sometimes folks want to set up some sort of a membership, you know, criteria you got to meet to call yourself a Christian, right? Yeah. But again, it's not about whether or not you are worthy enough to walk in that door or whether or not you've given enough on the offering plate or whether or not you have said the right things in some sort of a prayer or, or whatever. It's about simply believing in God and allowing God to believe in you. We can understand that sometimes and it's a beautiful moment. And even the best of us sometimes will struggle with that. And that's okay. You know why? Because faith is a journey, like I said. It's an ongoing journey. Sometimes that trail's going to be a little rocky. That's okay. That's part of how we get there. But the thing is, when we realize that, that we are Christians, alone, because then it really starts to shape us and change us. And we turn that understanding into a blessing to others and what it is we do and what it is we say. They got it almost right back in the day, but they put the card in front of the horse, if you understand what I mean. It wasn't that works gained you faith. It was that faith allowed you to do those works. So we're not off the hook on doing deeds of charity and goodness. Don't get me wrong on that. But it's by faith that we become Christians. What does your faith call you to do? What is it that you feel that yearning in your heart to say or to do because of that faith? That's the question I'll leave you with this morning. Hopefully you understand a little bit more about how God much God loves you. But what are you going to do with that? How are you going to turn that? How are you going to allow that to change you? How are you going to allow that to change the world around you? That's what it's about, friends. Amen? Amen. Thank <laughs> you.